Good morning, Financial Phil. Good morning, Rob. How are you, sir? I am better now that you are part of my day, Phil. That's what I'm talking about, my buddy. That is what you are, the shot of coffee I needed after a long weekend of volleyball. Just call me espresso, Sorry. baby. We don't matter at all, I'm Bill. Glad. Yeah, he's not, he's not said that <laughs> to us at all, yeah. Phil. <laughs> I'm glad to be back. Yeah. In fact, all he says, I hope Phil gets here quickly. <laughs> Save the show. Well, Save the show. That, We're... Bill, I wasn't sure. I would have given you a shout-out as a shot of espresso, too, Bill, but I, did, I wasn't sure if you were on. I was running a little bit behind, so normally I'm listening before I call. And then the John says, what is he, I, chopped liver? Chopped liver, that's it. It's a new radio name, and yeah, chopped John, liver. I, and I don't like liver. You're my donut, John. You're my donut. <laughs> and Bill and Rob are my coffee. All right. All right. All right, I'm not sure why you need two cups of coffee, Phil, but uh, just as long as I'm the first long cup of weekend. coffee I'm having. Yeah, it's true. Long it felt like a long weekend, even though it wasn't. I mean, it was it went Saturday, Sunday. I worked Friday and working Monday, but it did feel like a long, nice Easter weekend. I I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed well, yours. I, I did, and it was it was it was a long weekend as we were in Philadelphia with uh, you know we talked about financial field. I'll take that hat off for a second, give a shout out to my travel volleyball team quickly, but they've had a tremendous season, and we just wrapped up the regular season. On Easter Day, these girls are playing volleyball. So to show the commitment that uh, How'd you do? they have. We did okay. We didn't go as far as what we had hoped, but we beat some really good teams, really good competition, and uh, it ended a few games earlier than what we would hope, but they, they played hard. Is your and, season yeah, over now? You think about that. It, the regular season is we'll go to Chicago at some point later, this year for the national tournament, they did earn a bid for the national tournament. But, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, we're talking about 14-, 15-year-old girls that have played, uh, I think where our record was 60-15, and 15, I think. Don't hold me to that. But uh, they played 75 matches over the course of four months. And, you know, some of them even listen to financial field. They make fun of me. But they, they a few of them even listen from time to time to the show. So I hope that since they're on spring break, I hope some of them are listening right now. That's nice. Congratulations, ladies, and uh, best of luck when you go to the national tournament, too. Yep, they'll we'll get a break, and we'll be right back at it. So for the next few months, I get to be solely financial fill. All right. Well, that was pretty cool that you were financial fill in Philadelphia. It all worked out kind of nice. Yeah. 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 Phil, so we got job numbers on Friday. What did those job numbers tell us, and how does the market react to those numbers? I don't know that there's any reaction to it. They weren't as strong as expected, which is good for our markets. And we are in that strange period, and we probably will be for, for at least a few more months where weakening a weakening economy could boost our markets. It just it, It's all dependent upon the pace of how our market weakens or our economy weakens and how our markets react to it. We want to see inflation come down. We all know that. And part of that equation is a weaker economy. But if it's drastic, and now we're getting to this point, you know, back at last fall, if it was a, a drastic weakening of the economy, I think our markets would have done well. Something really important, and it, it's difficult a lot of times for us to separate the two, but the markets and our economy do not behave in lockstep. There's a lot of periods where our economy is weakening and our markets are going up. That's where we're at right now. And there's somewhere our economy is doing is doing great and knocking it out of the park, and our markets are going down. That's where we were at about this time last year. So it is important to remember that so you don't hear a good economic report or a bad economic report and try to push that forward to your stock or your portfolio and say, well, hey, heck, what, what's going on here? Our economy is doing great, but my portfolio is doing terribly. Our markets are a forward-looking measure. Our The, the economic reports that we get, are backward-looking measures, so there's a separation there, and, and, and that, that sometimes confuses a lot of investors. Where we are in that cycle right now is a weaker economy will give our markets a boost. That job market, what, our, our job numbers was a little bit weaker than expected, but not enough to really move anything. We are focused on that CPI number that comes out, I think it's on the 12th, and we get big bank earnings. I think those are more important than normal because of the the bank weakness that we had seen just a few months ago that inserted a little bit of fear into us. There's also confusion. Jamie Dimon blasted a lot of people uh, over the week. I think it was over the weekend because they said, hey, this weakness that we saw could be good. And, well, it slowed down. It's not necessarily good. 
it's not good for big banks and, and earnings for sure. Any weakness in banks isn't good for that sector. But it was kind of good for our overall markets because it's a signal of weakness. So we have to separate those two. And it's difficult to do sometimes because they bleed together. But just like always, that CPI number is going to be really important. The expectation is it's a 70% probability right now that the Fed is going to increase rates a quarter of a percent. That's the widespread belief. That CPI number is really the CPI, PPI, and the PCE that comes out a lot of initials. But the, the beginning indications of what they may do comes out on this well. So it is important. The importance of that CPI number is starting to diminish, though, unless it's a shock. Unless it's shocking? Unless it's shocking one way or the other, it, it's beginning to diminish a little bit simply because the rate of the pace of rate increases are diminishing quite a bit as well. So we wouldn't expect in any way, shape, or form that they would go back to a three quarter of a percent increase like we did last year unless it was something that, was, that just blew it out of the water and scared us all to death. I couldn't imagine that happening. And that's the downside of risk of the CPI. But but it is a little bit less important whether or not it exceeds expectations or is below expectations of these inflation readings. It's a little bit less important than what it was before. You know, before, if we expected 6% and we got 62 our markets may fall 2 or 3%. If we miss that mark this time, I don't think it would be so drastic. So, Phil, we've had this conversation, but I need a little enlightenment on uh, human behavior from you here, okay? So here we go. So what interest rates were <laughs> what interest rates were three percent and my bank was paying me like five one hundredths of a percent interest and I was getting like eighty six cents a month. I was like, Yeah, who cares about my bank? But now that interest rates are like six or seven percent, my bank is paying three point four percent on a savings account, and now when I see interest at the end of the month, I'm like, Hey, look at that, it's a good number. I like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yay inflation. Yeah. Let's go. I, I'm I'm yeah. wrong to be rooting for that higher interest rate, but why does it feel so much better than when rates are low and I was getting a penny a month interest on my account? Well, I, I you're you're not <laughs> you're not applying that interest rate return that you're getting against inflation and so what was you know if you had money sitting in a bank before and it was not even worth looking at or entering into your register that you got this interest payment of like you said 86 cents but now you're getting maybe uh, 18 dollars and 60 cents or something to that effect but we're not applying the rate the the rate of inflation against what we're getting on our risk-free rate of return and it still trails the same amount you know that's something it, it is good if, look if you hold on to cash if you say look i'm going to have this much cash regardless of what the environment is this is my comfort level or this is what my financial planner told me i should be doing this is how much i should hold in liquid cash and when we say liquid cash we don't mean cash money in your pocket or in your in your dresser drawer we mean that you can get to it over the weekend or you can make a phone call and have it in your hands immediately. You're not taking any market risk where it could be reduced in value if you have to liquidate at market risk or interest rate risk like SDB went through. You know, the bank went through. That was what was their issue. They had this interest rate risk or market risk that they were dealing with when they sold securities to meet the withdrawals. Well, people do the same thing. You know, it's the same thing on a personal level. If you have your money in something that you, you perceive as it's not volatile and, it, and maybe it's not all that volatile, but if it's down in value and you're forced to sell it to meet some sort of obligation where you have just locked in your loss at that moment, but, <laughs> but if, you're, if you hold on to that cash regardless for that person, yeah, it gives you a little bit of, of a boost that so you at least feel better about that portion of your overall portfolio. And we'll play it forward, and there's still a lot of people that do this that they have nothing but cash. And that that was more prevalent with people that have pensions. You know, all of their savings went into pensions. So they're on that, you know, I'm doing air quotes right now, that fixed income of Social Security and pension. And the only thing that they have, they may not have many investments, if any at all. And it's just all in cash, maybe time deposits and CDs and money markets where they're not taking any risk whatsoever. Now, that doesn't happen that much anymore uh, for, for people my age that are building into retirement because the pensions aren't as prevalent as what they were before. But those people are certainly happy. They don't, they, to them, you know, I'm sure they see the increase in cost at the grocery store and gas and so forth, 
but what my savings is bringing back to me it used to be nothing, and now it's something, so they feel better. But we do have to apply that toward the, the inflation rate and what's that money actually giving us, and you're still losing value just like you were before. You're still losing the same amount of purchasing power as what you were when, when rates were almost zero or zero. Yes. I was thrilled when I got the, uh, the the amount of interest for the month, and then I went to the supermarket, and it was like six bucks for a box of cereal, and I wasn't as thrilled anymore. Hey, I wanted to bring this yeah, to your... It was gone. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Even though the box of cereal is mostly air. Uh, so in regards to uh, the first quarter of the year, I, and in the first weekend of April, I was checking my wife's TSP account, which is basically the 401k plan for government, right? So... Yep. She, she has she has some in small caps. She has some in the S and P tracking index, and some in international. And the international stocks, as a rate of return, actually outperformed the small cap stocks and the S and P five hundred index stocks in America yeah. in the first quarter. Even though both of those numbers were also positive, Phil. And I, I had uh, not paid a lot of attention to international stocks because they've really underperformed U.S. markets for so long. But in the first quarter of this year, that was a different story. Yeah, and over the long haul, and we have to we have to remember international. And so many of us look at these countries that we're not too we we don't look too favorable upon. Uh, well, international. I don't want China in my portfolio, or I don't want Russia in my portfolio. It's international. We're talking about the entire world, and and a lot of that comes from countries like India or emerging markets and. You know, India is an interesting case study. I, re I really like looking at their economy because they are such a large population. And it's just, I, it, and I could be wrong, so don't, please don't quote me on this. But I think population wise, they're second only to China. They're also the youngest population, and they're also, also the most educated population. But their economy is still an emerging market, it's growing at leaps and bounds. So when you see investments in countries or companies in countries like that, they do can it does tend to be more volatile and and it does if you looked at a small cap U.S. Uh, index and an international index, it does look kind of similar as far as the standard deviation and the rate of return over time. But when things go well for international markets, they go really well, and when they go poorly, they go really poorly. Then it should be a part of everybody's portfolio, even if you're mad at China or, or Russia or whoever it may be, and you're thinking, hey, I don't want investments in these countries. You do need investments in those countries. And oftentimes, you know, as, as, a, as a, uh, a balance against U.S. equities, there's oftentimes where U.S. equities aren't doing well and international equities are. That's why they always announce the, you know, this is what our, the value of our dollar versus this currency is and blah, blah, blah. That has something to do with the, the U.S. equities and international equities, and that's not all that uncommon that it would outperform the United States companies. It's not all that common at all. The, now, the, the rate of what you should have in your portfolio should be smaller than what it is in, in the, than, than the exposure you have to U.S. equities, but it is important that you have that as that overall diversification. Financial Phil is with us here on the program from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors. As I look at stock futures this morning, I see we are in the red. The Dow futures are off a bit more than a third of a percent. S&P down by a bit more than a half. NASDAQ futures are down about three quarters of a percent so far this morning, Phil, which is, I think this is kind of unusual considering they're working off of Friday's, or I guess Friday's jobs uh, report. Markets were closed Friday. And they're still waiting for key inflation data. Usually, we kind of meander around, uh, you know, neutral here when it's like that. Why are we losing ground more so this morning? I don't know, and I don't know if the bank earnings has anything to do with it, or some of our fear of what this, the the information that we would get uh, throughout the week. And, and again, yeah, and I'm I'm as guilty as anyone as looking at pre market information and extrapolating that throughout the day and being surprised at lunch when I swing back around and look at their markets. Oftentimes it's a text from you that makes me look and because, and you know, I sit in meetings with clients all day, so we don't really stare at the markets except for points throughout the day. We'll take a look at it. But, but I don't know. It could just be fear of what this information coming up. And if you look at your portfolio for 2023, especially on the equity side, and you just mentioned it, it has done really well. So if you've got a little bit of fear of what the news may bring, whether it's bank earnings or that CPI data that comes out, and, and you're thinking, well, how much good can this information do this week? 
maybe some portfolio managers and even individual investors are selling a little bit just out of fear. I don't really know the response to it, though. Earlier this morning when we spoke at 630, I think two were slightly in the green and one was slightly in the red. Mm -hmm. And at some point between there, we, we've given a little bit more back at and again, that could have been a Federal Reserve member speaking. Uh, that tends to move the markets more so than CEOs or Jamie Dimon or or, or um, Mark Cuban or any of the market movers when they speak. It, it, it could have been something simply a Federal Reserve member being negative in his tone with what the pace of rates would be. And it, it kind of spooked us a little bit. But, um, you know, we, have to, we do have to remember that the pre-market is – most often not exactly indicative of what the day turns out to be. John? I decided to go and do a little research and look into the past. When I was but a little boy on the eve of JFK's inauguration, December 30th of 1960, the Dow was at 616, 616. When I graduated college in 1979, it had only grown to 811. But then... In 80, uh, 85, when Mr. Mario graduated from college, it had jumped to 1199. And by 2008, it was at 12,800. And now it's hovering in the 33,000s. This geometric progression on the Dow, is it, is it just a math problem because you double a bigger number and then and, and you get a larger number? Or is, has something fundamentally changed over the course of time to, to make what would seem a stupid number. I mean, 33,000 in 1960, nobody wouldn't think it was possible. I remember in the early 90s um, being given a book that talked about the 20,000 Dow as, a, as the unachievable uh, goal. What's going on? What, what accounts do you think for the geometric progression of, of the markets? There's a lot of narratives in that, and, and one you, we just talked about it is, is inflation. You know, inflation plays a role in that. Uh, two, let's throw in some technology, uh, technology and our ability as individual investors to make trades on our on our cell phone within moments if we hear something and the pace at which we get news and we read headlines and we'll react off of it. And by lunchtime, we've changed our mind about what we want to do. And so there's a lot of movement in the buying and selling of individual companies and over time, that does cause uh, this crazy growth. And free, our inner, we talked about this just a second ago as well. We're now a global economy. And our, our every company, if it's a large cap company, it is a global company. So the ability for someone, especially in the United States, to sell their goods and services overseas and to put you know, think of McDonald's to put a place in every single country in the world. And at one point, I don't know the pace of McDonald's. I'm just using them as an example. I used to use McDonald's as an example when I would go into my daughter's class and talk about the stock market because they all knew McDonald's. But, you know, if you watch that, uh, the movie, basically the making of McDonald's, I forget the name of it, but it is a, I think every student that's in business should watch that movie. It's, it's fantastic. Michael Keaton is a part of it. But when you look at how, companies like that started to grow and then went international and now they're in every single part of our world well every company has done that so the international aspect of our large companies in the united states uh the ability to use technology and do these things overnight you know john talks about the days where you would fax in an order or mail in an order and mail in checks you don't have to do that anymore man i mean you could have a check and we can scan that check in and be buying stuff for you within minutes and before that was a process it took a while to get all that stuff going so the speed in which we can invest and the comfort level at which we can invest and I also throw this out here the need for people to invest and to buy these equities because pensions aren't as prevalent as what they used to be right so before you didn't need to do that hey I'm going to work this job for 40, 45 years or 30 years or whatever it may be, and then when I retire, they're going to provide a stream of income. And that model had kind of failed because of longevity. People had lived too long. And now so we're, we're fearful of putting money into these pensions. And they're still there. They're, they still exist, but they're not as prevalent. They're not as popular as what they used to be. So now 401Ks and TSPs and Roth accounts and SEPs and SIMPLEs and 403Bs and 457s and 
all of these things that's entered our society that we need to have in order to retire that didn't exist years back when some of these these dates that you were giving me with the Dow, they weren't there or they weren't as prevalent. So the need for investors to be uh, exposed to the market is there now, and it wasn't before. So there you go. You like throw all of those things together, and that's why you see this tremendous growth in our markets. A good answer, Phil. When I was when I was uh, just starting out as an investor, you know, right around college age or whatever, if you wanted to buy a stock, you had to call a broker. He would then place your order. You would get a bill for like two hundred dollars, <laughs> but not even counting the price of the stocks. But that was the that was the service fee and commission that they charged you to do that. So you had to buy a big enough order of stocks to make that worthwhile. So therefore, most people didn't buy stocks. You had to be a, considered yeah, a wealthier even, person. We have a uh, a client. She has a story that it makes me laugh, and I ask her to tell it all the time. But she was working in an office complex in the early eighties. In or mid 80s, or at some point, and some cute guy, in her words, came up and was selling stocks. He was like a door to door salesman, and he was trying to sell a penny stock of, I think it was Apple. And so he was trying to sell this stock, his technology stock, and she was going to buy $100 of it simply because she thought he was cute, but she didn't have her checkbook. So she said, can you please come back the next day, and I will buy $100 worth of stock. But he didn't come back. <laughs> so he apparently, she says, he didn't think I was cute as well. If I were prettier, I would be rich right now. But, uh, but he never came back. The limitations of looks. <laughs> but, but now you think of that, though. You know, you had someone, and I wasn't around for this. I was playing basketball out in my front yard or chasing my little my older brother around or something. But you think about that, just like you had said, you had someone coming, bugging you at work to buy stock, and you had to have your money on you. And then you would write a stranger a check, and then you would get this in the mail, and you would get a stock certificate. All of that stuff has changed. There's stock certificates. How many, how many people have ever seen a stock certificate? Yeah. Of course we have because of what we do. But you would find out most 30, 35, 40 year olds have never seen a stock certificate, an actual piece of paper that looks like a car title mm -hmm. that tells you that you have this much shares of stock. And if you were on a drip plan or a direct investment plan where dividends were buying more stock, you kept getting those. And yeah, I might have a whole book of stocks. Now you just buy them online in seconds, maybe even from your phone yeah. really quickly. With no commission charge in most cases. Right, commission free and no and no advice it allows you to make a lot. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> Phil. How do we reach you for more information today, sir? You can reach us at three zero four two six three four three four three or stop by and see us with an appointment at twelve seventy Winchester Avenue, right here in Martinsburg. Phil, talk to you tomorrow morning, sir. You guys have a great week. Financial Thanks, Phil. Each morning at 6.38, you can hit uh, Phil's preview of the day's markets. What happened the day before? We played at 